Okay, we're recording now. So <clears throat> on Google Classroom, I already posted uh, two handouts. You'll need one of them right now. And that will be the handout entitled From Books to Canon, The Formation of the New Testament. This of course is um, a fundamental issue that we have and it concerns why do we have these 27 books in the New Testament and not others? And how did these 27 books get included in the New Testament canon? And how do we look at tradition in relationship to the New Testament canon? Um, and all of that will be addressed to some degree as we move through this handout today. And like I've been doing, I've been giving you rather full uh, transcripts of the content of these lectures so that you'll not only have them in writing that you could read on your own, but you would hear some of my um, elaborations and explanations that are not actually on the page. I would, <clears throat> I would advise you also with regard to this issue of the New Testament canon or the canon of the entire Bible, including the Old Testament, to do some self-study on this as well, uh, hoping that you'll augment what we talk about here in this lesson. And I would suggest that uh, if you don't have a lot of resources that, um, of course, you could go on to the computer and look at internet sites. And one of the internet sites that I have found to be valuable for theological uh, research is theopedia.com. If you're not familiar with that one, perhaps you could log on and investigate that. Just do a Google search for theopedia.com. So it is a, an intentional um, mimicking of wikipedia.com. But Wikipedia, of course, is not a Christian source. It's a leftist source ideologically. Theopedia, however, is not. It is an evangelical uh, website, and you'll be able to find lots of information on there. And it's, um, it's a rather trustworthy site, in, uh, in my opinion. And since you can log on from anywhere in the world and read <clears throat> that material, um, it's good to know that it's free. And um, so perhaps you'd want to do a little bit of reading on Theopedia for this matter of the canon of the Bible. If you have a study Bible, such as the NIV study Bible or the ESV study Bible, or any number of other similar study Bibles, oftentimes study Bibles have um, an additional essay about the canon of the Bible. And I know that I've read these in my NIV study Bible, uh, also in my ESV study Bible. Those are not lengthy discussions. Uh, they're rather compact, oriented toward helping a lay person to be able to understand this matter. And if you're leading people in the church, people who are lay persons, that kind of material in the study Bible might be what you would recommend to them to read if they, uh, they, if they come to you with questions about the canon. Um, there are full-length books in our library on the, the matter of canon. One of the best ones that I know of is the book on the canon of the Bible by Bruce Metzger. And it's a book that I read a number of years ago, and I will be using a little bit from his research uh, also in what we're going to talk about today. But go to the library and look up the matter of the canon of the Bible and find a source or two there in the library that would continue to add to your understanding of the, the canon of the Bible and therefore your ability to explain it to people in a church setting. So 
and, and that's my advice, of course, on all of the topics that we've gotten into this semester, that you would be able to further investigate beyond what you've read in Carson and Moo, beyond what you've read in Fee and Stewart, beyond what you've read in the notes that I have provided to you. Uh, those are all good resources, and I hope that you preserve them and use them for your own reference for years and years to come in the future. <clears throat> uh, and if you don't have other resources than that, um, those three resources are uh, going to be adequate for you to have a, a basic understanding of the New Testament documents that will undergird your preaching and teaching. Um, but in all of these subjects, if you can, set aside some of your earnings to buy additional books for your library and learn from those additional books. Uh, do additional research online using quality sources in order to gain information that will help you in your preaching and teaching. Share information back and forth with one another is another good thing to do. And I just mentioned that as we get closer to the end of this uh, semester um, to make explicit what I would basically assume that each of you would do anyway. Since you're studying at the masteral level, you have more ambition uh, than others. And I assume you have more desire than others to learn about these topics. So I encourage you to do further research uh, through the use of other sources into the various topics that we've gotten into this semester. And we're really only able to touch the surface on this matter of the canon of the New Testament because uh, we only have one, one time, one session here to address it. I'm not even sure that what I've prepared will take up the entire session today. And because of that, we may have some time left over to begin the next topic, which is New Testament theology. And again, our discussion of New Testament theology is only a very cursory introduction because <clears throat> we only have one week or a little bit more than one week or one session to address this. When at CGST, we have often offered classes for a whole semester on New Testament theology. And it's a class I've taught numerous times in the CGST curriculum. Um, another class is Pauline theology, which is even a smaller portion. We've taken a whole semester to do just Pauline theology. So again, with the New Testament theology, our last subject for this semester, it is basic stuff. It's introductory. It's cursory. There's a lot more that could be said about that topic as well. So... <clears throat> you would have to look into it. And there are lots of good books in our library that are entitled New Testament Theology or Theology of the New Testament. And you'll be able to find them rather easily. Okay, so that's just kind of um, uh, a, a briefing about today and next Thursday's class. So let's turn to this matter of the New Testament canon <clears throat> and you'll wanna have in front of you, either in paper or in digital form, this uh, handout from books to canon, the formation of the New Testament. Okay, <clears throat> so because of ministry in a Catholic country where we all are concerned, um, we, find, at least I find it necessary and, and helpful to start off with the content of this first paragraph where we, we draw upon Bruce Metzger and an observation that he has made in his book on the canon of the New Testament. So at the top of this page, you'll see this stated. Bruce Metzger, in his book entitled The Canon of the New Testament, published by Oxford Press, in 1987 and page one, uh, hold on a second. <clears throat> okay, um, <clears throat> he says this, he asked this question, is the New Testament canon, quote, 
a collection of authoritative books or an authoritative collection of books, end quote. Now, you'll see that that's a very clever statement. And the significance of this, this question is found in the use of the word authoritative. In the first part, the first expression, notice that the word authoritative is an adjective and it modifies the word books, authoritative books. But in the second term, which is the alternate term, the word authoritative does not modify books. Instead, authoritative modifies collection. And the significance, the meaning of those two opposite or contrasting statements is extremely important. And we're going to talk about that here in response to this question. So is there any question about what is the issue? We're contrasting authoritative books versus authoritative collection. Any question about that? So in other words, does the authoritative rightly apply to each individual book or does it apply to the collection as a whole? His answer, that is uh, Metzger's answer, is that the canon of the New Testament is the former, and that is a collection of authoritative books. So that the word authoritative applies to the books, it does not apply to the collection, okay? And it goes on to illustrate this more. It is not an authoritative collection or list of books. This is very important distinction for us to make. If the books were authoritative inherently, from their time of composition, then they naturally possess authority by virtue of their inspired nature. And this is proved by their use in the churches in the early church history before there was a complete collection or final list. So that's a little bit of an elaboration on why it's important that these are authoritative books. That's the reality, that's the truth, that's the priority. On the other hand, if the books only became authoritative when they were collected together and deemed canon by some body of church leaders at some date much later in history, then the church leaders' actions invested them with the value they did not have earlier, and the church leaders possessed the real antecedent authority to make the book something that they were not earlier or inherently. Metzger's question is very important one. So notice here that if you opt for the second phrase, and that is the New Testament canon is an authoritative collection of books, then whoever establishes the authoritative collection has authority that is prior to or even higher than the collection that they produce. And so if that's the case, it fits rather nicely into the Roman Catholic authority for church and Bible. So if you've got through apostolic succession, people who claim to be the inheritors of Peter's office, and therefore the Bishop of Rome, and he can collect around him other church officials of high rank and authority, authority cardinals, that, <clears throat> and if they sit down at the table and decide these books are in the New Testament and other books are not in the New Testament, then the authority abides in the men who make the decision. Okay, so that's very friendly to the Catholic approach. Whereas if the books have authority on their own because they're inspired by the Holy Spirit, then no human being gave those books their authority. 
the one who gave the authority to the books would be God himself or the third person of the divine trinity, the Holy Spirit, who inspired those books to be God's word. Any questions about how this becomes important on this matter of canon? We're going to presume as we move forward that it's the first term which is true and that the New Testament canon is a collection of authoritative books, authoritative books by virtue of their inspiration. And we do so because we stand in the evangelical or Protestant tradition, but also this is true. This is the correct process. <clears throat> this is the correct priority, correct evaluation of this matter. I think Metzger is entirely correct. And people like Carson and Moo would agree with, with Metzger on this issue. Any discussion or questions about this? Because the books are inspired from the beginning, from the time they're composed by the human author, they inherently, or they by their nature, have authority. Any question, discussion? Okay, we move on then. <clears throat> what about the word canon? Now, canon is not just a great big gun that you find at Fort San Pedro when you go there and visit. That kind of canon you spell with two N's. It's K -A C. A-N-N-O-N. -N -N. And this particular word, canon, has only one N in it. Comes from the Greek word kanon, and it originally meant measuring stick. But in time, the term came to mean rule or standard. But by the fourth century AD, the word denoted a closed list of standard books which composed the New Testament. Prior to this kind of usage of the term, Prior to this development of the term, the word canon referred to normal or normative doctrine or ethical content. So it's like standards or morality. That would be the kind of thing that we're talking about in the early um, usage of the word canon. And since the Bible established, uh, the books of the New Testament established, the things that were normative doctrine, and they established what was proper ethical content, it becomes a written expression of that and therefore synonymous with the Bible itself. So that's, that's the idea of canon. Uh, number two, authority is the key concept, both at the beginning and at the end of the canonical process. Okay, so we're really going to focus on the issue of authority. <clears throat> what kind of authority makes these books into canonical or sacred books and make them worthy of being included in this list of 27? Okay, so first of all, we think about Jesus. Jesus is ultimately our authority, isn't he? He's the one who says that he has all authority. So Jesus' teaching was noted in the Gospels. Uh, I'm thinking of the Gospel of Mark. When over and over again, Mark informs the reader that Jesus taught with authority. And that contrasted with Jewish teachers of that day. Jesus was unique. So Jesus' teaching was authoritative. Furthermore, Jesus called uh, his apostles and he extended his authority to them so that they taught with delegated authority. And I think of the Great Commission in the Gospel of Matthew, which begins with Jesus saying, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he proceeds to give them a command, go and make disciples. And one of the great components or one of the great processes or procedures of the Great Commission is further stipulated in the Great Commission. How do you make disciples? Well, first of all, you baptize them and you use a triune formula, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But then it goes on to say, teaching them, teaching them, teaching them. So in commanding them to make disciples, 
and commanding them to teach others about what Jesus said, what he taught, and so forth. He was extending through his own authority, authority to the disciples who are apostles to be teachers on his behalf. And so what are they to teach? Well, the Great Commission goes on to say, uh, teaching them to obey or to keep all that I have commanded you, all that I have commanded you. And of course, that includes all of the Gospel of Matthew. But by extension, since these other 26 books of the New Testament are equally inspired, holy writ, then they also ultimately come from God and from Jesus. And so the disciples are to make disciples by teaching what the New Testament teaches. <clears throat> so they're kind of linked together that way. So Jesus has authority. He extends it to his disciples. And for a period of, of ministry, a season of ministry, they're teaching orally, that is in person through sermons and lessons and so forth. Eventually, they get old and they're going to die and their ideas are put in writing. And we'll get to that in just a few minutes. So authority is a key concept. Jesus called his apostles and taught them um, and delegated to them authority. Their teaching of the gospel was originally what we call oral tradition. So Peter went around Galilee and Judea giving sermons, and people remembered what he taught. Of course, he would have said similar things in each of these places. Like he's not, there's not a new gospel to, to give when he moves to a new city. He's teaching and preaching the same gospel about Jesus and his death and his resurrection and so forth. And so a lot of what gets said in one place gets spoken also in another place. And people remember this. And so somebody who hears Peter give a sermon, he goes and he tells his neighbor, he tells his wife, he tells his cousin, he, tell, he, he uh, tells his business associate, and then they repeat it and tell it to someone else. And so there's a body of oral tradition that's floating around very soon after the disciples start preaching and teaching the gospel. And what we... The term we use to describe that is tradition, oral tradition, or paradosis. Uh, and this paradosis occurs in the first few decades of the church. And there's some good illustrations or verses in the Bible we can turn to to see that that's not a bad thing. And a qualification here, oral on oral tradition. Oral tradition which passed on the essential truths of life, death, and teachings of Jesus was valued in the early church. Even somebody as conservative as Carson and Moo, they will say that. You can look that up in your book. <clears throat> A lot of times we're very, as evangelicals, we're very suspicious, to say the least, of tradition. Uh, at worst, we're just downright opposed to it because we've seen tradition used in ways which is very unhealthy in our Roman Catholic context of ministry. But in the early church, oral tradition was not a bad thing. As long as it complied with or agreed with the truths of the gospel, it was considered to be good stuff. And in the first few decades of the church, the more trustworthy source for knowing the truth would have been someone who's an eyewitness, someone like Peter or James or John, Thomas, and so forth. These guys who were called by Jesus and taught by Jesus, sent out by Jesus, and possessed his authority. So all of that's good oral tradition. There was at the same time the possibility of bad oral tradition, only traditions that were deemed to be contrary and thus merely human in origin were rejected. And so you get Jesus speaking about or against the traditions of the elders, 
and Paul saying similar things and Jewish traditions that do not comport with the teaching of Jesus. These things are condemned and we don't want to use tradition like that even now. So there's good tradition and there's bad tradition. When the 12 went out and preached and when they went out to teach about Jesus, they were communicating good tradition. <clears throat> so the books of the New Testament were originally witnesses to the authentic gospel tradition as their authors interpreted the gospel to various church and ministry contexts. So they've, they've been understudies of Jesus for three years. And now he's died. He's been raised from the dead. Pentecost has occurred. And all of the 12 have the Holy Spirit that enables them to do the kinds of things they could not do before Pentecost. And so they're out there giving messages about Jesus. And <clears throat> when they went from place to place, there may be a slightly different way they explain the gospel truth to different people. They were doing what we now call in missiology, contextualization. They are taking into account the conventions, the values, the language, the abilities and experiences of the recipients as they attempt to explain the gospel truth about Jesus. And so they adjust it, they modify it, they interpret it for the various audiences. And we've seen that this year in our study of, and survey of the New Testament. We saw that Matthew wrote up his gospel very differently than the gospel writer Luke, because Matthew was writing, we believe, for a Jewish Christian audience. And so he was contextualizing in the way he explained the Jesus story. He contextualized it for that kind of reader. Similarly, Luke contextualized the message of Jesus when he described what Jesus was for his Greek audience, the person of Theophilus. So those are two very, very stark contrasts that we were able to consider last semester in New Testament one. Then we could add the Apostle Paul, who was our focus for half of this semester. We know that he's Jewish. We know he's a Hellenistic Jew. We know he's a diaspora Jew. We know that he's fluent in the Greek language, and evidently also he's fluent in the Hebrew languages. And so he's one of these Jews that's already been involved in doing some contextualization because he grew up in Tarsus. And at some point later in life, before becoming an adult, he transfers to the city of Jerusalem and he gets Pharisaic training there under Gamaliel. And so he's lived in two different cultural contexts. And <clears throat> as he has matured and become an adult, he finds out about this guy, Jesus, that there are these other questionable Jewish figures running around telling people that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, that he's been raised from the dead, and people need to believe in him in order to be able to go to heaven and, and so forth. And this, this Jewish Pharisee, Saul, decides this is just heresy. And he begins to persecute the followers of Jesus because they were bearing a bad message, a faulty message, and so forth. But then on the road to Damascus, God reveals Jesus to him. And he finds out, well, this Jesus is in heaven. He's appearing in this bright light. He's speaking to me, and he must not be dead. Um, he must not be cursed. If he's in heaven with God the Father, then he's exalted. So there are all kinds of things that have to suddenly change about the Apostle Paul and his thinking about Jesus because of the Damascus Road experience. Because of that, he's also uh, able to say that I was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And so Paul was the earliest interpreter of the paradosis about Jesus. 
he was an early contextualizer of the message of Jesus because he took the message of the Jewish Messiah Jesus to the Gentiles and was greatly successful with churches on Cyprus, in Turkey, in Macedonia, in Achaia. Those are the ones we know about. And so Saul, who became Paul, was an interpreter of the gospel. And so he was explaining it to a different audience in ways that they could grasp and understand. <clears throat> and so it wasn't just Matthew and Luke that were interpreting or contextualizing the message of Jesus. Paul was actually doing it before either Matthew or Luke wrote their gospels. So in these situations, we find that the oral tradition about Jesus is the thing that's being used and it's being done effectively in the early decades of the church. So uh, we have this good tradition that we're talking about, but then there was bad tradition, which became set aside and marginalized. <clears throat> so the New Testament, the books of the New Testament, were originally witnesses to the authentic gospel tradition as their authors interpreted the gospel the various church and ministry contexts. So what we have in writing is to be consistent with what was reported and proclaimed orally before the writings existed. In most cases, the New Testament books were written expressions of apostolic authority by virtue of the author being an apostle. And we know that that would be true, for instance, for the letters of Peter, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel and the letters of John, and the letters of Paul. All of these guys are apostles. And so, by definition, their books would be authoritative. But then there is an additional situation that we need to take into consideration. There are authors of the New Testament documents that are not apostles. So, in most cases, New Testament books were written extensions of apostolic authority by virtue of the author being an apostle or by being closely related to and or dependent upon an apostle. And in which case we then have an explanation of why Mark and his gospel qualifies and Luke and his gospel. Mark, according to the evidence of the New Testament, had been associated with both Paul and Peter. Luke, according to the evidence we have, was associated with Paul himself. And he tells us that he did a lot of research to come up with the stories that he tells us about Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. So those two guys are examples of authors that are closely related to the apostles. Then we have the book of James, the brother of Je half brother of Jesus. Of course, he's closely connected with apostles. Um, we have the writer of Hebrews. Now that's the book that we have the most questions about because we really don't know who wrote it. And so we don't have an argument as to his connection to an apostle. So that's the one that uh, gives us some concern. So. An early example of this tradition is, quote, for we learned the plan of salvation from no other others than from those through whom the gospel came to us, referring to the apostles. They first preached it abroad, and then later, by the will of God, handed it down to us in scriptures to be the foundation and pillar of our faith. That is quoting Irenaeus in his book Against Heresies written in the second century. So here we have a source that's very close to the point of origin of the gospel story. He's close to the oral tradition, but he's also close to the composition, the New Testament documents. And he says, it came from the apostles. They handed it down to us in scripture. And this becomes the foundation and pillar of our faith. And so that's basically what we're saying here, even today, as the longstanding uh, understanding 
of this matter of canonical authority and why these books are in the New Testament. <clears throat> so that's section 2.1. Any questions, comments, discussion of section 2.1? All right, we'll go on to page uh, number 2.2. At the time of its composition, an individual New Testament book was not part of a canon or collection. Those that didn't exist at the time that Paul wrote Galatians, for instance. Each book was written separately. At least nine different authors composed the 27 books over a period of about 50 years. Each book was originally received and interpreted separately and individually by its addressees at a particular time and at a particular place, or like in the case of the book of Revelation, places, because it was sent to multiple destinations. <clears throat> in the following cases, there were instances of an audience receiving an initial document that was followed by another document, and the latter could be interpreted in light of the former. For instance, there is the Gospel of Luke, followed by the Book of Acts. So both were addressed to Theophilus, and we know that the Gospel is the former book. So it preceded the Book of Acts. Whatever Luke intended Acts to mean, it would have been somewhat informed by what his Gospel had already said when Theophilus is trying to understand the Book of Acts. Similarly, when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he wrote two letters. It seems like he wrote them fairly soon after visiting and starting the church in Thessalonica. And shortly after the first letter was sent to them, a second letter was sent to them. So they could interpret the second one in light of the first. But we don't know that the Galatians could have done anything like that. When Galatians received that letter from Paul, there was no antecedent Pauline letter that they could have used as a basis for doing that interpretation. <clears throat> Similarly, we have the church in Corinth. We know that Paul wrote multiple letters. Our second Corinthians in the canon would have been introduced and understood partially by what Paul had already written to them in 1 Corinthians. But we know that that's just a partial picture of what was going on between Paul and the church in Corinth. He had actually written four letters, and that our first Corinthians is actually letter B, and our second Corinthians is actually letter D. So that in the case of the canonical second Corinthians, there are actually three documents that had preceded those, and the Corinthians would have used them, knowledge of those letters as they attempted to understand and interpret 2 Corinthians. So that's a very special case. We've also got the two Petrine letters, <clears throat> where clearly the first one is designated in such a way because in the second letter, he talks about the first one that had been written. Then you have two letters to Timothy. For these cases, an antecedent writing provided an interpretive base for the subsequent writing. In the case of Philemon and Colossians, which were delivered at the same time by the same messengers, two letters were read together. And we also have reference to the letter of Laodice to Laodicea that we could also throw in here. It's also possible that some of the Johannine literature was read together. For instance, the document 1 John read in light of the Gospel of John. Generally, however, each document was read and interpreted on its own with help from prior knowledge coming from the Hebrew Bible, from apostolic preaching and teaching, and other early oral traditions. So we're thinking about when these authoritative, inspired documents, mostly letters for, for us during New Testament too, when these documents came, what was the, the basis for their understanding of what was in these letters? So what we're getting to is what's 
next, the next paragraph, and that is an excursus on exegesis and canon. So excursus means you're just going to make a side trip and you're going to deal with a particular topic in a little bit more detail than uh, would be normally called upon in a composition like this one we're reading. So <clears throat> an excursus on exegesis and canon. Initially, the church could not employ the hermeneutical principle, scripture interprets scripture for New Testament documents. Okay, scripture interprets scripture. That's one of the basic hermeneutical skills that you're taught in Bible college. And that is to, to use a concordance to find other verses that speak about the Holy Spirit. Um, find other verses that talk about salvation and so forth and add together the information that you find in multiple verses to come up with a total teaching. Well, <clears throat> we can do that in our situation, but initially the church could not do that. This was impossible for two reasons. First of all, before the individual 27 New Testament books were collected into a whole, not every church, not everyone, had all 27 books. The canon had not been formed in the earliest stage of the interpretation of these New Testament documents. Two, in order for someone to interpret scripture with scripture, there must be a fixed body of literature that everyone could recognize as scripture. So if you're in the Galatian church and you receive this six chapter letter from the Apostle Paul, you read this as advice from an authoritative apostle, of course, and you take it as God's word, but you're not reading it because you know that it's part of the New Testament. The New Testament does not exist in time where the Galatians first interpret Paul's letter. And that would be similar for the other documents in most cases. So they could not do this because they didn't have the collection and they didn't have a collection that was called scripture. The canon of the New Testament was not finally fixed, meaning closed at 27 books until the fourth century. And for modern Christians, we can follow the principle of scripture, interpret scripture, because first of all, we possess a completed New Testament canon. And secondly, we regard all 27 books in the same qualitative category of canon or inspired sacred literature. That was given to us by our ancestors. We didn't have to make decisions regarding that. We've assumed it from the beginning in our Bible interpretation. But what we're trying to point out here is we have a finished canon for our basis of interpreting New Testament texts. Whereas the first readers, the first hearers, the first recipients, they did not have that. But still, it was meaningful to them and it was authoritative to them, even under those limitations. Inspiration and canonical status mean that scripture is superior in quality to all other literature okay so you can go to national bookstore and you can buy lots of good stuff on christianity uh, you can go to omf and buy lots of christian books but there's one book that qualifies as inspired in canon and that is the bible we always have to keep that in mind canon canonical books they're inspired Books about the canon are not inspired. And that's true even if you go back to the very early Christian literature, like we just cited Irenaeus, an early church leader. His writings are not inspired. The writings of Clement or Polycarp or Ignatius, none of those are inspired documents. The canonical documents, though, they fall into the category of inspired. So that puts them at a higher level because of the inspiration. When we interpret scripture with scripture, we're practicing what we call canonical interpretation, something the original readers or interpreters could not do. 
we need to remember that exegesis seeks to know the text's original intent. And original intent was not constructed originally by reading one New Testament book in light of another New Testament book in most cases. However, we today in our churches, as we lead congregations, we must allow scripture to interpret scripture in our process of constructing theology today in order to compensate partially for our distance from the original setting of the individual New Testament books. We must employ this procedure now while recognizing that the original readers of the text could not do what we must do. Since the Holy Spirit inspired the New Testament text, the Spirit ensures a basic unity of the whole New Testament revelation. And this unity becomes also a warrant for us using the principle, Scripture interprets Scripture. So in some ways, we're in a better position for being able to know proper theology because we've got the whole list of 27 books before us compared to the first century person who may have had only one or two books that end up being in the New Testament. Their advantage, which we never have, is that they're close. They may have had a real apostle visit, share the gospel with them, and start the church that they're part of. That's never been true for us. It would be impossible for us. So we have advantage, they have advantage, and we have to work with the situation we're presented with. So we will use canonical interpretation. We will use scripture, interpret scripture. But in the back of our minds, as we practice exegesis, we recognize that we're doing something that the original readers may not have been able to do. <clears throat> Any questions, comments, discussion of that section 2.2, including the excursus? We'll move on to 2.3 then. <clears throat> the individual books existed as 27 separate books before they were collected together. And they were authoritative in the churches of the addressees before they were collected together as a canon. So we go back to the instance of the book of Galatians. When they read what Paul wrote to them, they took this as important serious apostolic teaching that they believed would be the word of God and that Paul was speaking for God as he gave them those instructions. And he had said the same thing to, him, to them when he was present. He would have said something like, I was called, God therefore sent me out. He invested with me the mission to the Gentiles and I'm here to tell you what's been revealed to me. This is what the early church followers say about Jesus. And he taught them on that basis. And so his ministry was inherently authoritative when he was live and in person before them. And of course, that inherent authority would have been invested also in whatever came to them in the form of a letter. <clears throat> So these books had their authority before they were all collected together as a 27-piece assembly. In other words, the individual books of the New Testament were authoritative in local churches before they were gathered as, collect as a collection and deemed the canon of the entire church. Because of their antecedent authority in the first century and following, their authority was not established during the fourth century at church councils. During the first 300 years of the church history, the virtues of the New Testament books themselves caused them to be read and used in the local churches, whereas other unworthy books fell by the wayside. It, once you had been taught the true and proper gospel, it became uh, possible for a person to judge whether another writing or another letter or another gospel was 
untrue. And so those books that presented false ideas, heretical ideas that were not genuine, that were not authentic, these books fell by the wayside through these, um, through these decades and even through the centuries. So the book's natural authority was the primary thing in this time before there was a final canon. The New Testament books did not gain their authority by being canonized. From the beginning, they possessed authority inherently, which was partly due to the authentic message they contained and the authorized sources of their messages. So we go back to those two criteria. <clears throat> so that's paragraph 2.3. Any question? Any comment? Any discussion about 2.3? <clears throat> We'll move on to 2.4 then. On what basis did individual books qualify to become authoritative in the church? Well, there were three criteria for canonization and answer this question. First of all, generally a book had to be apostolic. Apostolic meaning um, an apostle. That's what we mean. So one of the 12 or possibly Paul as the 13th. But this was construed broadly to allow some of the authors to be associates of apostles, men such as Mark and Luke. Nevertheless, not all New Testament books qualified on the basis of direct or indirect apostolic authorship. In such a case, the second and third criteria are more important. So we move on to number two, the content of the book the teaching that it contains had to be consistent with the oral gospel tradition in the early church. This is what has been called the rule of faith. In other words, if Paul had been to the church and he had taught them what the uh, true and proper gospel is, that church would never be disposed to accept a letter or gospel from someone else that contradicted what Paul had already told them. In the early, early decades of the church, a live, living, apostolic witness was far more authoritative than any written document. <clears throat> That's just the way it was in those periods of time. So when a book came along, it was judged on the basis of what the gospel oral tradition had, had already established as truth among the churches and so forth. So it had to comply with the rule of faith. That's criterion number two. Number three is the use of the book had to be widespread and continuous throughout the period of the early church. When these three criteria were true, there was evidence of inspiration which led to canonization eventually, along with the other 26 books. So that's paragraph 2.4, the criteria of canonization. Any questions about that? Excuse me. Okay, we'll go on to 2.5. Why was a New Testament canon necessary? early on in history? Well, there are three reasons. A, the apostles were the bearers of authoritative tradition, and they began to die as the decades passed. This tradition had to be put in writing to preserve it. So that's one of the primary reasons why a canon was necessary. Then we go to the second, B, there was an increasing heresy within the church. A canon was needed to help define the boundaries between sound teaching and heresy. So if the apostles are no longer around, they're no longer able to referee between good and proper teaching and bad false teaching. So what would substitute the writings that they leave for the church to use? <clears throat> for example, Marcion reduced the number of authoritative books. And so the number 
27 or another number was in debate. The creation of a canon helped to end that part of the debate. Montanism valued prophecy, which made gospel teaching vulnerable to subjectivity. So Montanism really valued prophecy and therefore people could claim to be prophets given the gift of prophecy. And when some prophets start making very strange teachings or claims that do not sound like the gospel or the oral tradition of the gospel that had been taught earlier, uh, a chaotic situation is created. And <clears throat> the formation of the New Testament canon helped to referee this kind of thing because the canon and the 27 books are objective. More than one person can examine these 27 books. But on the other hand, when someone claims to be a prophet, where does the message or the words of the prophet come from? It comes from within the prophet. And nobody can read his soul. No one can read his mind. They just have to hear what he says and accept either it is the word of God or it isn't the word of God. And so a written New Testament corpus helps to referee whether a prophet's saying a prophet's teaching is good, correct, and <clears throat> uh, valuable. So that has to do with the pro problem of Montanism in the early church. Then there's the problem of Gnosticism, the heresy called Gnosticism. Gnosticism valued secret knowledge at the expense of common knowledge. So here again, we have the subjective secret knowledge that's being played off against the objective which is common knowledge. So like it was with the prophet, secret knowledge is subjective. Common knowledge is objective. So the Bible is on this side. Everybody who claimed to be a Gnostic or a Christian would have the Bible and would have to deal with it in some way. But Gnosticism valued secret or <coughs> subjective knowledge and that could be very different from one person to another person. <clears throat> so a canon helped to judge and referee the developing uh, writings of Gnosticism and the teachings of Gnosticism. Uh, so a canon helped to provide some control over an increasingly chaotic and diverse theological challenge. C. There was a growing body of early Christian literature, such as, for example, the Acts of Paul and Thecla, the Gospel of Thomas, the Revelation of Peter. Decisions were needed about the authority and worthiness of these kinds of books, which were eventually viewed as apocryphal. And so the canonical process dealt with that as well. And so why did we need a canon? There were three let three reasons that were offered there. Any discussion, questions, comments about section 2.5? So all of this section two has to do with the authority as the key concept at the beginning and at the end of the canonical process. If there are no questions, we'll move into section three, which is a, a sketch of the different stages in history and the canonization process unfolding. Okay, section three, the earliest period of the formation of the canon was AD 60 to so AD 140, in which the books were used in the churches. So section 3.1, evidence within the New Testament of authority and early groups of individual books. So this would be the, the period of the writing of the New Testament documents, AD 60 to 95. What evidence do we have actually in the New Testament documents <clears throat> that uh, a canon of the New Testament was on the way or was conceived of in some manner? Well, there are a number of things we can say about it. First of all, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16 mentions letters in the plural of Paul 
and this implies that some collection had commenced as early as AD 60, okay? That would be on the early side of when the letter of 1 Peter or 2 Peter would have existed. Uh, and it speaks of these letters of Paul's in the category of other scriptures. So in that case, you've got an apostle and you've got his writings that someone other than Paul is claiming to be of scriptural status, which of course means that there's some inspiration, there's authority, uh, there is sacredness in the writings of the apostle Paul. And this was probably within the lifetime of Paul himself when this text was written. Next, Luke chapter one, verses one to four. These verses, they speak of other gospels that existed before Luke's, and this implies that a collection of gospels had already commenced. For Luke to have multiple exhibits before him to use as sources implies that there's a collection. So we see that early on, letters were being collected and gospels were being collected, at least in some places. Next, Paul tells the Colossians to read his letter to the Laodiceans, implying that it had authority there too, and vice versa. And so you've got this sharing of the letters that are witness to in multiple communities. And that, of course, implies that an apostolic letter had authority in places other than where it was originally received. <clears throat> Next, the synoptic gospel studies that we learned about last semester holds that Mark and the non-canonical source called Q were sources for Luke and, and Matthew. And again, this process implies that a collection was being made <clears throat> because Luke had to have at least two sources, one of them being another canonical gospel. The same would be true for Matthew. So this implies a collection. Next, the general epistles and the book of Revelation. Each of the documents in this set of literature imply that they carry authority over numerous churches. So Peter's written to a half a dozen different places. James is written to uh, Christians scattered abroad in the dispersion. Uh, the book of Revelation names seven churches that are the recipient of that document. And so general epistles and the book of Revelation, because of their recipients, imply that they carry authority over numerous churches. And so those are some biblical passages that point us in the direction of an authoritative and inspired collection of books that would eventually take place. Then we move to the next segment of church history. In section 3.2, we look at the evidence for the authority of the New Testament books in the early church fathers, AD 95 to 200. What Bits and pieces of evidence can we gather from these sources? Well, first of all, First Clement, it's a Christian document written in the last decade of the first century from Rome, sent to Corinth, uh, views Pauline letters and Hebrews as authoritative. And I've given you the, the chapter and verse references in First Clement. You can look these up if you want. Uh, another document called the Letter of Barnabas, written in Alexandria in the latter first century or early second century, cites Matthew 22, verse 14, as written. <clears throat> and so if he's citing it and using it, it, it implies that it is authoritative in the life of the church. Uh, Second Clement, another document out of Rome written in the early second century, quotes the words of Jesus from Matthew, which have a parallel in Mark chapter 2, verse 17, and calls these words scripture. So within basically a half a century of the origin of Matthew or Mark, these documents are being viewed 
at least in one place, as scripture. Another example is Ignatius, an early church leader who was the bishop of Antioch of Syria. Early in the second century, he knows of Paul's letters and he views them as authoritative. And Ephesians chapter 12, verse 1, that's not the New Testament book of Ephesians. That is instead Ignatius's letter to the Ephesians. That's the only way you can have 12 chapters. Next, Polycarp, who's Bishop of Smyrna, knows of all but three of Paul's letters, and he cites them as authoritative. Next, Marcion's List, working out of Rome in the middle of the second century. He had all 11 books, and he had an edited version of Luke, 10 Pauline letters, but he did not have the pastorals. So again, within decades of these documents' existence, they're being collected and used, even by a guy who ends up being a heretic, Marcion. Then there's Justin Martyr, again, in Rome, middle of the 20th, 12th, second century, reports that he has the memoirs of the apostles, that be a, a reference to the gospels, were being read in Sunday worship, okay? So if they're being read before the church, there is naturally the assumption that they are authoritative in the church when this is being done. Tatian, late in the second century, a student of Justin Martyr, combined the four gospels into one volume called the Diatessaron, implying that all four gospels were authoritative and they're important so much so that they could be combined in such a way that the reader would get the content of all four of them, but in one document. There's the Muratorian Canon or Fragment List late in the second century. It lists 22 books, the Gospels, Acts, 13 Pauline letters, two Johannine letters, Jude and the Apocalypse. So late in the second century, about a hundred years after these documents came into existence, there is this list of books that were being used. Another reference is called the Skeleton Martyrs, late in the second century. It talks about the books and epistles of the uh, just man Paul. So again, it's plural. The books and epistles implies that there was a collection of those that this writer knew about and used. Then the last citation is from Irenaeus, again, working out of Rome late in the second century. He seems to know of 22 books, four gospels, Acts, 13 Pauline letters, 1 Peter, two Johannine letters, and the Apocalypse. And you'll notice how similar that is to the list of, of books in the uh, Muratorian fragment about the same time. So late in the second century, this idea of a list or a group of canonical books is beginning to be uh, full. It's not complete, but it's beginning to be full and rather standardized. Then we move on to section 3.3, evidence from later sources from about AD 200 up to 400 in which the books in use were recognized. So a little bit later in history, so we're going to be looking here at the movement of this standard list ascending up to and stabilizing at 27. Tertullian, church leader in Northern Africa, Carthage, early in the third century, knew about 22 books. Then there's Clement of Rome, early in the third century, had 27 books, but he knew of others as well. There was Origen toward the middle of the third century in Caesarea. He knew of undisputed books, such as the four gospels, Acts, 13 Pauline letters, 1 Peter, 1 John, the Apocalypse. But Origen also spoke in his writings about books that were disputed. In other words, in some places they were not accepted or being used, in other places, they were being used. And those were 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, Hebrews, James, and Jude. So it didn't take a lot of opposition in order for the book to fall into this category. But 
thanks to origin, we know that there were these different categories at that time. Next is Eusebius of Caesarea, late in the third century, early in the fourth century. He divides the books into two groups. The first group is called the Homo Legomenon, the recognized books. So these are the books that at that time were accepted and used as authoritative, and they became part of the New Testament eventually when it's finalized. Four Gospels, Acts, 14 letters of Paul, but by interpreting Hebrews to be a Pauline letter, 1 Peter, 1 John, and the Apocalypse. Those were the uh, agreed upon or recognized books. Then you have the anti-legomena. These are the disputed books. And those fell into two different categories. So some were mildly disputed. Others were majorly disputed. The generally accepted letters or documents were James, 2 Peter, Jude, 2 and 3 John. And you keep in mind that James was not an apostle and Jude was not, and there's no named author for 2 and 3 John. So these documents presented some interpretive challenges for some of the early churches and some of the early interpreters. But these eventually uh, became accepted and <clears throat> designated as New Testament canon. Then, by contrast, there was a, a whole set of other documents that were deemed not genuine. Books like the Acts of Paul, the Shepherd of Hermas, Apocalypse of Peter, the Epistle of Barnabas, and the Didache. That's not to say that they were full of heresy. A lot of those would have been uh, expressing things that were very, very biblical, but the author wasn't apostolic, uh, or there was some other issue that the book presented, which made it inferior. So you've got homo legomena, and you've got anti legomena in the late third century, early fourth century. Then we have the Cheltenham manuscript found in North Africa middle of the fourth century, has all the New Testament books except Hebrews, James, and Jude. The Council of Laodicea, AD 363, acknowledged 26 books lacking the Apocalypse. And the Eastern Church, for a period of centuries early on, uh, there was a dispute as to whether the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse should be included. And we see that in the negative situation in the count of 26 books. Then you have Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria, down in Egypt, about the same time, AD 367, declares a canon of 27 books. Then finally, you have the Car Council of Carthage in North Africa, late in the fourth century, in which Augustine participated, and that council acknowledged 27 books. And from that point on, the New Testament canon had been fully, finally, and completely recognized. But it wasn't because of what, they weren't canon because of the Council of Carthage. They were canon because the church recognized at this council that these books had the evidence of inspiration and authority and apostolic authorship. And they com complied with the early Christian gospel as it had been taught and preserved over those centuries. And for those reasons, they simply affirmed, yes, these are the inspired and canonical list of books that we should all be using as the church before us has been doing, okay? So that's a quick run through the history and the pertinent information about the formation of the canon over the first 300 plus years. Any questions about this uh, this material that we've just surveyed the history of this. Any comments? Good, good morning, sir. Good morning. Yes, uh, I just want to clarify about Martian, sir. Uh, Martian was rejected the revelations during his canonical. And if that is the case, sir, is there any book 
or any books that he rejected during his his canonical or canonization or the only revelation sir he rejected it well as you see in section 3.2.6 he has 11 books so he was either uh, yes. not in <laughs> maybe he was i missed the section of 16 so it was more than the book of revelation okay sir thank you uh, because my uh, signal is not really good yeah i understand good good question though other questions i good morning sir steve hello uh i yes i i'd like to i mean this is a very awkward question but then um this is with regards to the paradosis or the oral tradition could it yeah. be one of the reasons why jesus did not or was not an author of any book of the bible or because during his time was he, while he was preaching doing all these things uh because it's they were he was just doing paradoxes and doing the oral tradition and with that i mean if during his time someone could like john could possibly write everything that he was teaching could be one of yeah. them yeah kind of an apostolic stenographer of sorts yeah was it because of the oral tradition or it, it, god just it didn't, intended it to happen that he would not be part of the i mean this is very awkward you know yeah i'm not sure uh, if we have a good answer to that question why did jesus not write any of the new testament books himself um those would have pretty much guaranteed their acceptance and their authority pastor jasper the only thing we can say is that there's no evidence that he wrote anything uh, the evidence suggests that he taught orally his disciples listened to him they remembered what he said they transmitted that to other people in other audiences and those audiences then repeated it and transmitted it further and so we've got this extension of oral tradition that takes place so that by the time we get to let's say AD 60 and we've got dozens of local churches around the Mediterranean world they've all been taught through apostolic uh, persons or apostolic associates and they've been taught basically the same thing and so that becomes a groundwork a, a foundation on which to judge the later writings that exist. So that's not really your question, but it takes from what you just said and continues to observe that and um, explain it. Why did Jesus not write anything? I don't know. We'll have to ask the Lord himself when we come to, into his presence. Maybe your dad knows already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir, Steve. <laughs> oh, what's up, Ian? Uh, another good question. I've wondered that too. Why is it that Jesus himself didn't write these things? Well, he depends on people like us to get the message out. He has from the very beginning. That really says something about how Jesus views his disciples as important and even us today we stand in a strong long and important tradition as being followers of jesus each of us listening today or maybe even later in the recording we must remind ourselves that we are sons or daughters of the king and he has given us the status of being princes or perhaps a princess in the royal family. And with that status is a duty to use our gifts and our calling in a way which satisfies his purposes for us. And even if the world beats us up, even if the world takes from us and doesn't give to us, we have to keep in mind our own spiritual priorities that have been given to us from Jesus. Because we are very cross, 
we're, we're very countercultural, we Christians in this world, especially in the Philippines when you've got a, a major Catholic culture and people like us can easily be, be brushed aside because we're simply born agains. Uh, it just exposes how much we don't fit, but yet our gospel needs to be proclaimed and we need to be faithful in doing it. I see that we're at the time where we need to take our break. It is now 934, according to my clock. And so we can pause and take our 10 minute break and I'll be back with you in 10 minutes. See